Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Praise belongs to Allah. We praise Allah and we ask Allah for guidance and for forgiveness. We seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our own actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead them astray. And whomsoever Allah makes astray, no one can lead them back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah alone having no associates. And I bear witness that Muhammad is a servant and messenger of Allah. Believers, be mindful of God. Speak in a direct fashion and to good purpose. And he will put your deeds right for you and forgive you your sins. Whoever obeys God and his messenger will truly achieve a great triumph. Assalamu alaikum, my dear sisters and brothers. You know, last week, um, Roshi gave a, a, she delivered a very beautiful khutbah on family. Um, and there was, there was one line that really stuck out to me because it spoke directly to the topic that I actually had wanted and planned on addressing today. And although we hadn't coordinated our chutbas, they seemed connected and internally timely. You know, Roshi mentioned the Islamic importance of maintaining the ties of kinship and added that this does not apply only to your Muslim kin. And of course, this is something that I've, I know I've spoken about before, and it is mentioned um, in almost every Friday uh, sermon. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of give you a, a background on um, uh, on kind of what ignited my interest in, in um, addressing this topic. And so a few weeks ago, I was made privy to a situation where a family was, and without going into great detail, basically excluding a family member, or rather they were excluding the spouse of a family member. And these actions were justified because the spouse was perce perceived to be non-Muslim. And you know, upon hearing the story, I was saddened and angered because I know that this would not have been the case. So, so I mean, I was angered because I felt it to be wrong, but I also couldn't help but notice that this would not have been the case if the non-Muslim spouse had been a woman. So instead, we're talking about um, a Muslim woman and her non-Muslim husband or perceived non-Muslim husband. You know, I had a million thoughts and argumentative points to prove why this was so wrong on so many levels. You know, how could this treatment be justified from an Islamic perspective? And I'm sure we all know similar situations, right? I'm sure we're all familiar with instances where someone in a family married someone who the parents didn't approve of. Um, uh, you know, in this, whether it be a male or female child, you know, maybe it was an interfaith marriage, maybe it was cross-cultural, or, or one of a million reasons that a family um, disapproved of, of a relationship. Um, and you know what gets me? It's that in, in addition to being, you know, for a family to be, to disapprove of a, of a marriage is that oftentimes that disapproval is boasted about, right? As if this signifies stoicism in God's eyes, you know, this sort of macho, macho uh, retort, you know, I put my foot down or I, I said, you know, don't come in my house. You know, we've, we've heard these sort of um, comments or this attitude and it's done in a very like aggressive way. So, I mean, in any case, there are far too many Muslim homes that contain schisms within. And what usually happens? The splits drive deeper and deeper to a point that relationships between kin are severed. And, and I can go on at length as to how detrimental this behavior is, especially if there are you know, children, young children evolve, uh, involved. You know, now we're talking about it reaching to another generation. But instead of trying to make my point as to why um, this approach isn't good, I'll tell you a story. And so I want to tell you about Zainab bint Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon the prophet, and um, her marriage, her relationship with her husband. And so I'll read you a story about, about Zainab, brother, may, may God be pleased with her and her husband, Abdul al-As, may, may Allah be pleased with both of them. So who was Zainab? She was the beloved and eldest daughter of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
And uh, Abu al-As was her cousin. He was the nephew of her mother, Khadija, radiallahu anha. And he was one of the nobles of the Quraysh and a young family member whom the Prophet loved very much. And before the Prophet had received his mission of prophethood, Abu al-As uh, one day came to him and he had a request with an earnest and hopeful voice. He said, I wish to marry your eldest daughter. And the noble prophet graciously replied, I must ask her first. And so he went to sit with his dear daughter, Zainab, and casually broached the subject. He said, you know, your cousin came to see me today and he wishes to marry you. How do you feel about this? And would you accept him as a husband? So in similar nature and disposition to her father, Zainab remained silent and her beautiful young face turned red out of bashfulness, but she smiled, a smile indicating her acceptance. And so Zainab was married to Abu Alas, and so began the tale of a great love story. And their union was blessed with two children, Ali and Umayma. So during the period of time when Muhammad became a prophet, his son-in-law, Abu Alas, was away from Mecca on business. And after his business trip, he returned to find that his beloved wife was now a Muslim. And not long after he had returned, Zainab, unable to contain her excitement, of being a Muslim said to him, I have great news for you. And perhaps sensing that it would be something difficult to deal with, Abu Al-As stood up and walked away from her. Zainab was surprised and followed him. And she said, my father became a prophet and I have become a Muslim. And his, his reply was of incomprehension and incredulity. Why didn't you tell me first? And for the first time in their marriage, there ensued a big problem and difference between the two a problem of religion and belief. She told him firmly, I wasn't going to disbelieve in my father and his message. You know he is not a liar. He is a Sadiq Alamin, the honest and trustworthy. Trying to convince him that her decision was the right one, she continued. She said, I'm not the only believer. My mother and my sisters became Muslim too. My cousin Ali ibn, ibn, ibn Abi Talib became a Muslim. Your cousin Uthman ibn Affan became a Muslim. And your friend Abu Bakr has also become a Muslim. And overwhelmed by all of this, as she was saying, he replied, well, as for me, I don't want people to say he let his people and his forefathers down just to please his wife. But because he loved his wife Zainab, as well as his father-in-law Muhammad, uh, he continued softly, but I am not accusing your father of anything. So will you excuse me and understand? Zainab could only respond as her heart dictated, dictated her to. Who will excuse you and understand you if I don't? I will stay behind, beside you and help you until you reach the truth. And she kept her word for 20 years. Abu al has remained an unbeliever. Unbeliever. And then came the mandatory migration to Mecca, from, from Mecca to Medina. Zainab, unsure of what she needed to do, went to her father and sought his permission to stay behind and remain with her husband. The Prophet, وسلم, understanding the plight of his daughter, responded, yes, you may remain with your husband and children. So Zainab continued to live in Mecca as a Muslim with her non-Muslim husband until the time drew near for the Battle of Badr. Abu al-As was to fight in the army of the Quraysh against the Muslims. For Zainab, it meant that her husband would be fighting against her father. Undoubtedly, mm. at time, Zainab also had also has sorry. Undoubtedly, at time, Zainab had always feared. In prayer, she kept crying out, "Oh Allah, I fear that day the sun will rise and my children will become orphans, or the day I will lose my father and become an orphan." The Battle of Badr began and ended in victory for the Muslims. Abu al-As was one of those captured by the Muslims, and news of this reached Mecca. Zainab hesitantly asked, how is my father? What has happened to him? She was told, he is unharmed, and the Muslims won. And then she asked again, hesitantly, how is my husband? What has happened to him? And to this, she was told, he was captured. So she prayed to Allah, expressing deep gratitude to him for protecting them both and answering her prayers and said, I'll send something in payment to release him, right? She had to send a ransom, but she didn't own anything of much value except a necklace that had once belonged to her mother, Khadija. 
And so she took it off and sent it with Abu Alas's brother to purchase the freedom for her husband. While the prophet was sitting, taking payments and releasing captives, his eyes fell on the beloved late wife's necklace. He held it up and asked, whose payment is this? It was said, it was Abu Alas. At this, the prophet cried out, his voice heavy with emotion. This is Khadijah's necklace. As soon as the messenger of Allah saw the necklace, he was engulfed in a moment of extreme sadness, and his heart filled with overwhelming emotion at the memories which flooded his mind at the moment. The companions who were present, who were present there gazed in amazement, having been captivated by the magnitude of such an emotional situation. After what seemed to be a long silence, the messenger of Allah وسلم, stood up and said, O my people, this man is my son-in-law. Should I release him? And would you accept the return of the necklace to my daughter? So basically he's asking to release this prisoner with no ransom taken. And the, the companions being a part of this intense moment, they had all answered in unison, yes, O messenger of Allah. So the prophet gave the necklace to Abu al-As and said to him, tell Zainab not to give away Khadijah's necklace. Thereafter, the prophet quietly added to Abu al-As, Privately, he said, I will ask, can we speak privately? He took him aside and softly spoke. Allah has ordered me to separate a Muslim and a disbeliever. So could you please return my daughter to me? Abu al As, still having great respect for his father-in-law, reluctantly agreed. In the meantime, Zainab had stood by the gates. So she was standing by the gates of the outskirts of Mecca, waiting for the arrival of her beloved husband. When he finally came, he simply said, I am going away. Shocked, she asked him, where to? He replied, rather, it is not me who is leaving. It is you. You are to return to your father. It is as he has requested. We must separate because you are a Muslim. Anguish, hurt, and pain at the thought of being separated from her dear husband. She implored him, why won't you become a Muslim and come with me? But he had refused. So Zainab took her son and daughter and traveled to Medina. For six years, she refused to remarry, hoping that one day Abu al-As would come. After these six years had passed, Abu al-As was traveling in a caravan from Mecca to Syria. During the journey, he was uh, intercepted by some of the Prophet's companions. He managed to escape and asked for Zainab's house. He knocked on her door shortly before dawn prayers. She opened the door and happily exclaimed, have you become a Muslim? He shook his head and whispered, no come as a fugitive. She implored him once more, won't you become a Muslim? As if it had been before, so it was again, he answered in the negative. No matter the time and heartbreak, he remained to be her kin, father of her children, and still beloved to her heart. She said to him, do not worry. Welcome my cousin. Welcome the father of Ali and Umayma. After the prophet had prayed that the dawn prayers and congregation with the people, a voice was heard, a voice from the back of the mosque. I have freed Abu al-As ibn Rabib. It was the right and privilege of those to free kith and kin if they so wished. So Zainab had granted Abu al-As his freedom. The prophet addressing the congregation asked, have you heard what I have heard? They all replied in unison, yes, O messenger of Allah. Zainab then continued, he is my cousin and the father of my children, and I have freed him. The prophet stood up and said, O oh people, I declare that this man was a very good son-in-law. He never broke his promise, and neither did he tell lies. So if you accept, I will return his money back to him and let him go. If you refuse, it is your decision, and I will not blame you for it. The companions themselves, as kind-hearted as the prophet, agreed. We will give him his money and grant him his freedom. So the prophet looked towards his daughter and said, we have freed the one you have freed, O Zainab. Then he walked over to where she stood and quietly said to her, be generous to him. He is your cousin and father of your children, but don't let him get near you as a husband. She returned to her home where her husband, still thinking that he was a fugitive, was waiting. She addressed him searchingly and said, O Abu Alahas, didn't you miss us at all? Won't you become a Muslim and stay with us? But he sadly once again refused. 
Abu al-As then thanked her uh, for her help, took his money, and returned to Mecca. Upon returning to Mecca, he addressed the people and announced, oh, people, here is your money. Is there anything left? Anything else I was supposed to return to you? They replied, no, Abu al-As, there is nothing left. They thanked him for his assistance in carrying out their trade journey to Syria. Abu al-As's honor had been satisfied, and he owed no one, and he loudly proclaimed, I testify that there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. And after all these years, as well as separation from his, from his beloved wife, he had finally um, he had finally brought Iman and accepted Islam. In excitement and anticipation, he hurriedly returned to Medina and ran to meet the Prophet. Breathless from all the excitement of his reversion and journey, he reached the Prophet and said, Dear Prophet of Allah, you freed me yesterday, although we don't know it. We know it's not yesterday. It took many time, many days to get back and forth. And today I say to that, that I have testified that there is no God but Allah and you are the messenger. Without skipping a beat, he continued and asked the Prophet, will you give me permission to go back to Zainab to, for me to be her husband again? The Prophet, with tears in his eyes, smiled and responded, come with me. So together, father and son Allah made their way to Zainab's house and knocked on the door. The Prophet Muhammad called out to his daughter saying, oh, Zainab, your cousin has, has accepted Islam. And he came to me and asked if he can return to you as your husband. And just like 20 years before, her face turned red out of bashfulness and modesty, and she simply smiled. But their happiness together was not meant to last. Tragically, it was but a year after this incident that Zainab passed away. I say these words of mine, and I ask Allah for forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam ala rasulullah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of all mankind. I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace on the Prophet Muhammad. So there are many takeaways from this story, and you are free to interpret, understand it, and apply it as you see fit. But I do want to emphasize that compassion and acceptance were the key components that I personally gained from this story. Not once did the Prophet shun his son-in-law or reprimand him or exclude him or publicly humiliate him. And keep in mind, it wasn't only that he didn't convert for 20 years, but he also fought against the Muslims. Yet the ties of kinship were not severed because above all else, he was family. He was his wife's nephew and his daughter's husband. My intention of telling you the story is not to advocate or promote interfaith marriage. Rather, it is to remind us all that God commanded us to maintain the ties of kinship for a reason. We are to be upholders and representatives of Islam, and we have the prophet's, prophet's example as a guide. If you sever the ties of kinship, then oftentimes you sever the opportunity for someone, or even worse, an entire generation, to know Islam. And this is far from what the prophet did. So how could anyone justify that? Now, the title of, of this talk is Protecting and Maintaining Women. and I haven't really emphasized that so much and I wanna be mindful of our time together. And so maybe I will table that, you know, a, a deeper discussion into that aspect for another, another reflection. But I do wanna point out one other moment in the story that stood out to me. And that was the assertiveness that Zainab had when she declared that Abu Alas had her protection and the support her father, the prophet gave her. Wow, take a moment to reflect on that. This was the daughter of the messenger walking into the mosque and declaring an enemy and a fugitive of the Muslims was under her protection. And then her dad stands up and publicly supports her. This is a display of women's agency at its fullest. This is where the bar should be set in our community. When we talk about protecting and maintaining women from an Islamic perspective, this is what, in my opinion, should come to mind. Again, I could go at length as to how we could see more improved um, understanding of what it means to protect and maintain women. And if you don't know what I'm referring to is the first line in um, the verse, the 34th verse of Sultan Musa, 
where the law says men are the protectors and maintainers of women. I'm not going to go into this verse. I'm not going to go into it. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that one beginning part of it. Um, because what we see all around us is that not happening. And I would be remiss to um, not mention what's going on in Iran. You know, as a woman, I think that I am oftentimes feel bombarded by stories and experiences and incidents where um, women are slighted, to put it lightly. Um, women are undermined, women are marginalized. And I, and, I, and I think of what is said in the Quran, clear, clearly. Um, and then I look at how uh, oftentimes Islam is interpreted and applied and it, I just can't reconcile the two. Um, so again, I, I'll table this for another time, but think of Zainab, radiallahu anha. Think of her relationship with her father, the Prophet. Think of her confidence. Think of, of the support she knew she had um, in her father. Um, and again, this is where the bar should be set in our community. And I'll end it there. O Allah, please accept our good deeds, forgive our shortcomings and missteps, and allow us to experience many more Jummas together. Mm -hmm. Well, Allah, grant us the good, the good things in this world and the good things in the next life and save us from the punishment of the hellfire. Well, Allah, aid us in accepting the tests and tribulations of this life and give us the strength to overcome any challenges we may face. Well, Allah, we hope for your mercy. Do not leave us to ourselves, even for the blinking of an eye. Correct each of our affairs for us. There is none worthy of worship but you. O oh Allah, shower your protection over the family of Mahsa Amini and the people of Iran and all the people standing up for justice. O oh Allah, we ask you to lift the suffering of those around us, be it in our family, in our community, or anywhere in the world. If I have said anything of truth, it is from Allah alone, and my gratitude goes to Allah. And if I, if I have said anything that was not of truth, then that is from my own ego, and I ask for forgiveness from that transgression. Amen.